Hello, Abby. My name's Ben. Do you mind if I examine you? No. Could I ask you to stand up, please? And just face me? Inspect the legs with the patient standing and walking. Look for scars, sinuses, redness or rashes. Look for abnormalities of posture and common deformities, such as genuvalgum or verum. Particularly look for quadriceps muscle wasting. Now can you walk towards me, turn and walk back? Look for gait asymmetry and at what happens to the knee during the stance and swing phases. Could you sit back on the couch? Make sure the patient has both legs well exposed so that you can compare sides. Quadriceps wasting is almost invariable with inflammation or chronic knee pain and develops within days. It's often useful to measure the thigh circumference with a tape measure. Do this 20 centimetres above the tibial tuberosity and compare sides. Feel the warmth of the skin overlying the joint, which will be increased if there's any inflammation. For the patellar tap, empty the suprapatellar pouch by sliding your left hand down the thigh to the patella. Keep your hand there and with the fingertips of your right hand, press down briskly and firmly over the patella. For the ripple test, the knee and left hand are in a similar position. Empty the suprapatellar pouch and the medial side, then stroke the lateral side looking for a bulge or ripple on the medial side. I'm now going to feel around your knee. Let me know if it's sore anywhere. Palpate for the sponginess of synovitis either side of the quadriceps tendon. Then feel round the articular margin of the tibia. If there is tenderness, localise this as accurately as possible. Also feel the articular margin of the femur and the tibial tuberosity. And the same on the other side. The joint lines are most easily felt with the knee at 90 degrees. Focal tenderness may be due to a meniscal or collateral ligament injury. Isolated tenderness of the tibial tuberosity in adolescence may be due to Osgood Schlatter's disease. Next, we look at movements of the knee joint. First, active movements. Can you bend your leg up for me, please, Abby? Here, the examiner's hand is feeling the for crepitus. The, the normal range is from neutral to 140 degrees of flexion. Now could you lift it straight off the bed? When the patient performs a straight leg raise, look for extensor lag, inability to keep the knee straight. Now let me flex the leg. You would expect to find a similar range with passive movements. Full extension is when the tibia and femur are in longitudinal alignment and is described as zero degrees. And let your legs go floppy and let me take the weight. With the patient relaxed, lift the heels to assess for any hyperextension or recurvation. Up to 10 degrees of symmetrical hyperextension is normal. And just let me take the weight of your legs. To test the collateral ligament stability, hold the ankle between your elbow and side. Use your thumbs to feel the joint line and assess the degree when the joint space opens. And just bend it up a fraction. If the knee is stable, repeat the process with the knee flexed at 30 degrees. In this position, the cruciate ligaments are not tight. And the same on the other side. Just let me take the weight of the leg. With your thumbs in position, apply first valgus and then a varus force. Major opening of the joint with the knee extended indicates collateral and cruciate injury. And flex it up a little. If the ligament is lax or ruptured, movement can occur, but this may not be painful. If the ligament is strained but intact, the test will be painful, but abnormal movement will be limited. Now bend both of your legs up for me, please. To examine cruciate ligament stability, flex the patient's knees to 90 degrees. Look for posterior sag, which might give a false positive anterior drawer sign. Maintain the position of the patient's legs by sitting to trap their foot. Grasp the proximal tibia with both hands. Just relax your hamstrings. You can feel whether or not the patient is relaxed with your index fingers crossing the popliteal fossa. Abnormal forward movement suggests laxity or rupture of the anterior cruciate ligament. 
abnormal posterior movement suggests a lesion affecting the posterior cruciate ligament. OK, I'm now just going to bend your leg up. Let me know if it's uncomfortable. For the patellar apprehension test, start with the knee extended and press the patella laterally, then slowly flex the knee. Discomfort, apprehension or active resistance suggests previous patellar dislocation or instability. The test for meniscal provocation starts with the knee flexed. Again, just bend this leg up for me, please. To stress the medial meniscus, externally rotate the foot and abduct the thigh. Smoothly extend the knee, keeping the foot in the midline, which creates a varus stress loading the medial compartment. And bend it up again. To stress the lateral meniscus, internally rotate the foot and adduct the thigh. Apply a valgus stress as you smoothly extend the knee, thereby loading the lateral compartment. And let's do the same on the other side. Externally rotate the foot and apply a varus stress to load the medial meniscus. Bring it out to the side. If a meniscal injury is present, a click or clunk may be felt or heard, which may be painful. And finally, to test the lateral meniscus, internally rotate the foot and adduct the thigh to create a valgus load on the lateral meniscus. The final part of the examination is the squat test. Now could I ask you to stand up? Ask the patient to squat, keeping the feet and the heels flat on the ground. This requires flexion at the knee. Thank you very much.